I wanted to read from uh, this book, just a little bit of it, not the entire book, but from a little bit of a section of this book called uh, Person to Person, The Orthodox Understanding of Human Nature by Harry Busalis, or Busalis, I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name. But um, I really like this book so far. It's pretty interesting. Anyway, I'll start reading it. Chapter 1, The Human Body. God sanctifies also the very members of our bodies. St. Maximus the Confessor. Preliminary points. Contemporary man is obsessed with his body. This pertains not only to his own body, but to the bodies of others as well. We scrutinize each other's bodies. We're into bodybuilding and body piercing. We tan our body and tattoo our body. We try to enhance our body through plastic surgery. We even surgically alter the gender of our body in order to match our sexual orientation. Much of this is a manifestation of our materialistic and carnal-minded culture. But if we look deeper, perhaps this reveals a fundamental flaw in how we see ourselves and how we see each other. Upon closer observation, a tendency toward two extremes is apparent. On one hand, we take great effort to pamper and indulge our bodies. The advertising industry exploits and encourages sensuality. Seductive images of the human body are plastered throughout the internet, in magazines and on gigantic billboards, enticing us with various products. There is an over-infatuation with the body. For many, the human body has become an idol. On the other hand, our society openly disparages the human body. We discard the body through abortion before it is born and dispose the body through cremation once it dies. We give little thought to the natural and organic relationship between our soul and body. For many people, the common belief is that a human being is basically composed of an immaterial soul or consciousness, which is temporarily embedded in a material container, the body. According to this belief, this union is not permanent. Some, religious, some religions teach that our soul may be reincarnated into another body, and when that body dies, our soul continues to be reincarnated until attaining the ultimate spiritual state, that of no longer having a body at all. Other philosophies teach that our soul was never meant to inhabit a body in the first place. According to this teaching, our soul existed before the body. Our soul pre-existed in a bodily state, bodiless state. For this school of thought, as a result of the primeval fall, our soul is now trapped within our body and longs to be released from its prison. Here again, the highest form of human existence is for the soul to be freed from the shackles of the body, so it may return to the bodiless state from which it originated. The Orthodox Church teaches differently. Our soul is, is not meant to exist apart from our body, nor our body, body apart from the soul. There is an innate and everlasting unity between our soul and body. They will forever be united as one. The soul possesses such a natural union of love with its particular body that it never wants to abandon it, writes St. Gregory Palamas. Our body and soul are intended to function together in a harmonious and reciprocal relationship as one. According to Orthodox teaching, both our body and soul together make up our human person. Quote, every body is connected with one soul, every soul is connected with one body, and the two together constitute the particular person, a definite man. Un unquote. <clears throat> it's from uh, Metropolitan Herotheos in his book Life After Death. <clears throat> our soul was not created to be separated from our body. Sin and death. There is one exception, of course. During that unnatural and temporary tragedy of death, death is one of life's great mysteries. Our understanding of death reflects our understanding of life. How we see death impacts how we see ourselves, the world around us, and God. Death is a fact of life, yet the way we die is not as important as the way we approach it. Quote, will the death, as <clears throat> will the death we are facing be transformed into a gift, a source of life, or will it destroy us? This depends entirely on our attitude. Unquote. Death is the direct outcome of sin, and sin is willful, separ willful separation, willful self-separation from God. But on as many as, according to their own choice, depart from God, He inflicts that separation from Himself, which they have chosen of their own accord. But separation from God is death, and separation from light is darkness. Sin is when we separate ourselves from God. In orthodoxy, sin is not viewed in a legalistic sense, such as the breaking of a rule or regulation. Rather, sin is a spiritual sickness separating us from God, from each other, and from our true selves. Sin is when we abuse our God-given freedom. We sin when we make wrong choices that lead to our separation from God's will and likeness. Sin prevents us from participating in divine life, leading ultimately to death. For behold, those who keep themselves far away from you shall perish. 
Death for the Orthodox Church is not a punishment for sin. God did not create death. He does not want it. What God wants is our freedom, even if this means we might choose living for for and loving ourselves more than Him. God respects our freedom so much that even allows us to separate ourselves from Him. Death is not a punishment, so much as it is a natural outcome of what happens when we sin, when we cut ourselves off from the source of true life, God. The idea that death is a punishment from God for breaking His commandments is based on an inaccurate interpretation of Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. Quote, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. This does not say, If you eat of this particular tree, I will punish you with death. Rather, from an orthodox perspective, when God forewarned Adam, For in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. He was surely cautioning him that if he ate from this specific tree, he would be separating himself from the true life that God had given him. Far from what was originally intended by our Creator, the world is now bound by disease, dysfunction, destruction, and death. This is not the world as originally created by God. It is a result of our misuse of our God-given freedom. Our ensuing separation from God has led to dire consequences for the entire creation. Even though we are created in the image of God, in a world in a world originally created good and beautiful, we are in fact born into a death-bound universe. All people taste the terrible mystery of death, since we all inherit corruptibility and mortality. In other words, we are born to die. Death is the surest, most con- most certain event in our life. In many ways, however, we would rather forget death exists, seeking instead to preserve our youth. We lose sight of the fact that we have fallen from our original glory. This way of life, indeed this way of death, is not what God intends. Our separation from God results in death, engulfing the world since Adam's fall. There are two kinds of death. Physical death, the separation of our soul from our body, and spiritual death, the separation of our soul from God's grace. Physical death is when the soul soul leaves the body and is separated from it. The death of the soul is when God leaves the soul and is separated from it. Once separated from God, the soul becomes more ugly and useless than a dead body, but unlike such a body, it does not disintegrate after death. In spite of death, life is still good. Because of God's, God's great benevolence, life on earth is indeed beautiful. Life is so beautiful that at times we consider our sinful condition, even death itself, as natural to us. He died of natural causes. The truth is, sin and death are not natural to us. Our, our willful separation from God's grace and the consequent separation of our soul from our body are indeed unnatural. Sin, sickness, senility, old age, death, and bodily corruption, all these are alien to our nature as human beings. God did not create us to suffer these things. These are all consequences of separating ourselves from God, in whose image and likeness, likeness we are originally created. <clears throat> Quote, I weep and I wail when I think upon death, and behold our beauty, fashioned after the image of God, lying in the tomb, disfigured, dishonored, to be reft of form. Unquote. Holy Scripture describes man's fallen condition with the phrase, garments of skin. For Adam and his wife, the Lord God made garments of skin and clothed them. Garments of skin refers to our fallen mortal state in which we now live and will one day die. Garments of skin are not equated with the human body per se, at least not as originally created by God. Rather, these garments represent fallen fallen man's new mortality, which resulted from Adam's free choice to separate himself from God. The central content of the garments of skin is mortality and transformation of life into survival. God tolerates within his infinite love... God tolerates within his infinite love even this new situation and transforms it into a blessing, so that by using it correctly, humanity can survive and realize its original goal in Christ. Prior to these garments of skin, pre-fallen Adam in paradise was naked by virtue of his simplicity. In other words, before the fall, Adam lived in a natural harmony with the world around him. The body of Adam was so simple that it was in reality transparent, open to the material creation without resisting it in any way. When he fell... Adam broke his original relationship with God and the world. Our soul is now preoccupied, often obsessed, with passions of the flesh, worldly pleasures, and material possessions. Garments of skin conveys the reality that fallen man is now bound by a biological mode of existence. Man must now toil and sweat to sustain himself. He must protect, he must protect himself from, against the elements, even from the animals originally created for him. Man no longer has life in the way that he did previously. Life continues only so long as death is postponed. 
that which exists now is the in the proper sense is death life has been transmuted into survival bodily death has been a benevolence of god the church fathers teach that these garments of skin reveal god's goodness and compassion for man in light of god's great love and mercy death is considered as a removal sorry <clears throat> death is considered as a remedy for sin not punishment the inevitability of death can lead man to repentance and the struggle against sin saint basil the great writes god did not create death but we brought it upon ourselves by wicked by a wicked intention he did not prevent our dissolution that our weakness might not remain as immortal saint gregory the theologian adds yet here too man makes a gain namely death and the cutting off of sin in order that evil may not be immortal thus his punishment is changed into a mercy by tolerating death god prov providentially limits the extent of man's sin and separation from him our mortality not only limits the extent of our sin it also frees us from our personal sicknesses and sorrows saint cyril of Al alexandria teaches by death the giver of the law stop the spread of sin and even in this he reveals his love for mankind for death dissolves this animal nature of ours and stops the activity of evil and on the other hand it delivers or frees man from illnesses frees him from labors and puts an end to his sorrows and cares and stops his bodily sufferings in light of the resurrected christ it is better for us to grow old and eventually die this is to say it is better that our soul be temporarily separated from our body rather than our, rather than allow our unnatural separation from god to last forever <clears throat> By allowing man to dress himself in biological life, writes Nellis, God redirected death, and thus by death is put to death not man, but the corruption which clothes him. Death destroys this prison of life and corruption, and man is liberated through death. God provides us with opportunities to freely repent and from sin, to freely repent from sin and strive for true life in Christ, for which we are intended. So here we see God's love for mankind. He expels man from paradise, so that he will not remain mortal forever but may repent, and at the suitable time, through the Incarnation, may overcome death. So then, man's expulsion from Paradise was not a punishment by God, but an act of his love and philanthropy. <clears throat> Christ liberates human nature from the bonds of sin and death, through his <clears throat> and death through his death and resurrection. Furthermore, Christ empowers us as living members of his resurrected body, with the means to defeat the forces of spiritual death here and now. Through our personal participation in the ascetic, sacramental, and liturgical life of Christ's Holy Church, we are led to spiritual therapy. Here our spiritual illnesses are properly treated and healed. Death is a transient phenomenon. It is a momentary interim. When looking at death through the lens of Christ's resurrection, we see it in an entirely different perspective.